next news article discussion now look at this news article according to the news article the trade estimates released by ministry of commerce and trade has widened by 9.4 percentage compared to the last year the export have hit 200 billion dollar in the first quarter of 2024 and the goal is to reach 800 billion this year even though there is a increase in export it is accompanied by sharp increase in import as well which may push india's current account deficit to up to 1.4 percentage of gdp this is what the article is talking about so in this news article discussion we shall see some of the basics about the balance of payment and then we shall see about what is this current account deficit okay firstly know that the balance of payment is the record of all import and export transactions of a country during a period the main accounts of BOP or capital and the current accounts okay so usually the current account has day-to-day -day expenses when it means capital account the expenses or the receipt that is more than one year okay now coming to current account it actually records trade and goods and services and transfer payments it has two components firstly the balance of trade that is the import and export of a country and then balance of invisible which consists of services net factor income and unilateral transfers unilateral transfers are nothing but grants gifts and then remittances that is received by our country on the other hand when it comes to capital account it records all international transactions of assets like money stocks and bonds so with this basic understanding let us see about what is current account deficit see if the value of goods and services we import exceeds the export then the country runs into current account deficit now this current account deficit can be reduced by using two techniques firstly devaluation of domestic currency for those who don't know what is devaluation see if currently one dollar is 70 rupees when you devaluate it means you have to pay 80 rupees to get one dollar okay here it is like depreciation right so a voluntary depreciation is called as devaluation when you devaluate what happens is exports will grow because when people export priorly they will be getting only 70 rupees but now when people export they will get 80 rupees in exchange of a dollar okay that is why devaluation of domestic currency can help reduce the CAD secondly we can adjust suitable foreign direct investment policies again this can increase export due to increased competitiveness if you know the special economic zones these zones they substitute import and promote export which means they produce goods that we actually import and they also export it to other countries as well so these special economic zones can be encouraged by changing the policies of foreign direct investment and foreign portfolio investment so these are the two ways how we can adjust this current account deficit hope i uh, hope you could understand what is current account deficit and how it can be tackled so with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion now look at this article about money bill on monday the chief justice of india has agreed to list the petition that challenged the constitutionality of certain act passed by the parliament in the root of money bill so this is why money bill is in news today so from the prisons <laughs> India. These are all very for this news article. This news article talks about WPI. According to the news, the wholesale price index has reached a new high in last 16 months. So in this backdrop, let us revise about what is WPI from the prelims perspective. Okay. Now that WPI measures the average change in the prices of goods at the wholesale level, it is a critical indicator for understanding inflation and price trends in an economy. All transactions at the first point of bulk sale in domestic market are included. Major criticism of this index is that the general public does not buy products at wholesale price remember the base year of wpi is 2011 to 12 it was revised in 2017 before that 2004 to 5 was the base year for wpi talking about the weightage as you can see here the primary articles holds 22.62 percentage then the fuel and power holds 13.15 percentage and then the manufacturing products holds 64.23 percentage so the highest weightage is for manufacturing products also note this fact wpi is released by office of the economic advisor ministry of commerce and industry the wpi is released monthly with provisional data for the latest month and final data for the previous month so these are the general facts that you have to remember about wpi now let us see why wpi is important in an economy see firstly it gives a domestic insight wpi is crucial for understanding inflation at wholesale level before it affects the retail market it helps policymakers and then businesses and economists to gauge inflationary trend secondly it assists rbi and government for monetary or fiscal policies and thirdly it helps in international comparison it allows for inflation comparison across countries 
policies and this aids in economic analysis and international trade decisions as well. So we have seen WPI, it will be a fault if we forget to see about CPI. So we will see about CPI also. Know that CPI is the measure of price change in a basket of consumer goods or services. CPI is a numerical estimation calculated using the rate of a sample of representative objects, the price of which are gathered periodically. So it is basically calculated based on a basket of goods whose values will be changing from time to time based on what people consume. Okay. And remember the CPI captures change in price level at the consumer level. Changes in price based on a basket of goods whose values will be changing from time to time based on what people consume. Okay. And remember the CPI captures change in price level at the consumer level. Changes in price at the producer level are tracked by WPI. On the other hand, CPI can capture the change in the prices of services which the WPI cannot. Okay. WPI only the goods are calculated, but in CPI both goods and services are calculated. Unlike WPI, there are certain types of CPI that you have to remember. First is this industrial workers CPI, then the agricultural laborers CPI, and then there is rural laborers CPI. When it comes to industrial workers, it measures the alternation over a time period on the prices of a fixed basket, fixed basket of goods and services utilized by industrial workers. Similarly, the agricultural laborers, their consumption is measured under CPI agricultural laborers. And finally, this rural laborers, their consumption is tracked by CPI rural laborers. All these indices are published periodically by Labor Bureau and the Ministry of Labor and empowerment for all India as well as state and union territories. Remember, even if these indices are there, they cover only a segment of population. That is why we have designed three more indices with respect to CPI. You can see that here. The first one is CPI rural. This index measures the change in the price of commodity basket consumed by the rural population. Similarly, the urban population consumption is calculated by CPI urban. And when it comes to CPI combined, both urban and rural populations data is combined. The base here for all these calculations is 2011 to 2011 and it is published monthly by NSO, Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation. So these are all very important facts that you have to remember about CPI and WPI. Know the difference between the two and just remember the weightage that we discussed right now. It is very important with respect to prelims and mains examination. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this news article. This news article talks about the government's union budget for the year. The author says that this budget is like a litmus test. That is, it will strike the right balance or it will be flatter. This is what the article is talking about. So let us understand some of the important facts from the article using our mains answer writing discussion. Let me read out the question for you. What is budget transparency? Scratching its genesis discuss the benefits associated with budget transparency as well as the ways through which it can be promoted in functioning of a government. This can be asked in GS paper 3 and it is a straightforward question. So in the introduction you can give a brief outlook of Indian budget and you can try to quote a report on Transparency International. So starting with the introduction here you can write that budget transparency a vital aspect of good governance refers to the availability and accessibility of information on government financial activities enabling citizens to understand how public resources are allocated utilized and managed the concept gained significance in 1990s as countries faced fiscal crisis and citizens demanded greater accountability the international monetary fund imf and the world bank championed budget transparency as a key reform in the 1990s india too embraced this concept with a union budget 2017 to 18 being a landmark moment as it introduced the first ever budget transparency and accountability report. So you can quote these facts in the interaction part and move on to the first part of your answer. Here you have to write about the benefits of budget transparency. See the first thing is improving accountability. Transparency ensures the government are responsible for their financial decisions. For example, the controller and auditor general of India reported that union government's fiscal deficit reduced by 1.4 percentage of GDP between 2014 to 19. This indicates improved fiscal discipline. So this improved accountability is one of the benefit of transparency. Secondly, enhanced citizen participation. So informed citizens can engage in budgetary decisions, promote inclusive governance. The union budget 2022-23 received over 40,000 suggestions from citizens and it is a testament to growing public engagement. Thirdly, it helps in better decision making. Transparency facilitates data driven decision making, reducing the risk of corruption and misallocation of resources. The government of India's public finance management system has improved fund tracking and reduce by 10 to 15 percentage. Finally, it helps in increasing trust between citizen and the government. 
A survey by Transparency and Accountability Initiative found that 70% of Indians trust the government more when budget information is readily available. So you can write these points and move on to the second part of the answer. Here you have to write the ways to promote budget transparency. See the first and foremost thing is release of budget data. The systematic and timely release of all relevant fiscal information is directly linked with budget transparency. So disclosing budget document and simplified budget information through electronic and print media is very important. Secondly, effective role for the legislature. It must be able to scrutinize the budget report and independently review them. It must be able to debate and influence budget policy and be in a position to effectively hold the government to account. Thirdly, effective role of civil society and media. So citizens directly or through these vehicles must be in a position to influence budget policy and must be in position to hold the government to account. In many ways, it is a similar role to that of the legislature, albeit only indirectly. Finally, improving budget literacy of parliamentarians, government officials, elected representative, journalist, and select civil society representatives, and increasing their capacity to analyze budget. We can even create budget literacy manuals for capacity building programs. So you can write these points in your main answer of the body and move on to the conclusion part. Here you can write that budget transparency is a vital component of good governance, promoting accountability, citizen, partnership, citizen participation, and better decision making. By leveraging technology, publishing budget document, and providing timely information, government can ensure that public resources are managed efficiently and effectively. India's progress in budget transparency is commendable and continued efforts will strengthen trust and promote inclusive growth. So you can write these points in your conclusion part and finish your answer. So in this news article discussion, we saw about budget transparency, the steps taken by the government to ensure budget transparency, what are the benefits of it and how we can improve budget transparency. We saw all of that with a recent conclusion. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next part of the news article discussion which is now let us get into the discussion. So guys, look at this article. This news article talks about 15th July 2024. Displayed here are the list of topics that we are going to see today. Now let us get into the discussion. So, guys, look at this article. This news article talks about the resurgence in militancy in Jammu and Kashmir. 20 dynamics. Militant activity aims to provide immediate protection against Nifa virus, and the Nifa virus has high mortality rate. Post this destabilize the area now moving on to the population generation. now moving on to see about the measures that can be taken to address the resurgence firstly enhance the security deployment increasing the number of troops in Japan the grid and BRICS new article body aims to provide immediate protection against Nifa virus the bidders have confusion about the extraction of lithium from clay then other important challenges include the limited technology available in the country is an employer meaning existing labor laws apply to Uber drivers Neutrinos actually have some mass. Previously, neutrinos were proposed to be an underground laboratory and is excavated through mountains. The local people of Thani district have opposed this project due to its environmental concerns because it may affect the fragile Hello friends, welcome to Sankara A's Academy, Daily News Patra Analysis. Today's date is the recent report of Nitya the third one is going to be about green financing for the green projects. The next one will be the green steel making. And the fifth article will be about the prevalence of high unemployment rate in India. And finally, we will be moving on to the prevalence practice question section. So without much delay, let's get started. Look at this article. Here we are going to discuss about the PDS impact on household expenditure. PDS is nothing but public distribution system. See the questions on Food Corporation of India or public distribution system or even FSSAA has been a frequently asked question in both prelims and mains. So let's get to the understanding of this topic holistically. Let's start with some background understanding of 
of PDS. See, PDS actually traces back to 3rd century BC, where the Mahasthan inscription has some evidence to show the existence of PDS system there. And then, in the medieval era, Alauddin Kilji implemented price regulation and grain distribution, which is actually the main objectives of PDS systems. Moving on, let us see the early achievements of PDS and also its evolutionary path over the years. It actually reduced India's food scarcity during the post-war era or around 1960s. Then, it actually expanded the success of Green Revolution. Then, the PDS was revamped in 1992. It became more targeted by focusing on the targeted blocks of 1773. It offered 20 kg of rice at subsidized price. So then it was again revamped like targeted public distribution system TPDS. It actually focuses on poor and related schemes like anti rodea Anna Yojana was implemented. It identifies poorest among the below poverty line people. Then comes the National Food Security Act of 2013. It covers 75% of the rural poor and 50% of urban population under anti Odia Anna Yojana. Moving on, let us see the constitutional role of PDS. See, it is very important to understand the relation between constitutional articles and PDS. It comes very handy in both prelims and mains, so keep a note on it. Look at this, Article 47. See, it mentions like, it is the duty of the state to raise the nutrition and living standard. So, the PDS comes a point of focus here. And then the Article 21, which mentions about right to life. Here, the right to life indirectly ensures right to health, which is also interlinked with PDS system. Then, Article 14, which actually focuses on equality. It ensures equal access of food for all. Moving on, let us see the linkages between PDS and SDGs, that is Sustainable Development Goal. The goal one which majorly focuses on more poverty, providing affordable food to the vulnerable section, which is actually the main objective of PDS. Now the goal two, it focuses on zero hunger. Since PDS covers 75 percentage of rural population and 50 percentage of urban population, it indirectly and directly addresses the issue with respect to hunger and poverty. Moving on, the goal three, which stresses on good health and well-being, is an direct outcome of PDS system. And the goal five of gender equality is also been related to PDS and also the goal 10 of reducing the inequality by ensuring access to food for all is an objective and outcome of PDS. So moving on, let us see the food security system in India in brief. See the Food Corporation of India, which is actually the state agency, manages procurement, storage and distribution. See there are two types of procurement. One is centralized one and other one is decentralized one. Here the centralized one denotes the procurement done by FCA and also its distribution, which is actually a limited in role. Then the decentralized one. It is actually the state agencies procure from the remote areas in the states, which is actually the more effective one in practice. Let us now move on to see the challenges there in the PDS system. See, there is an existence issue of hardship for farmers due to the refusal of procurement due to lower staffs. And there is a high dependence on hired storage and also underutilized FCI facilities. And also there is a problem of lack of infrastructure in some regions. And also damage of food grains due to pests, leakage and rotting. And more importantly, climate change impact on the crop yield is also one of the major issues that is affecting the efficiency of PDS system in India. Moving on, let us see how we can improve PDS system and food security holistically. The first one will be digitalization. By preventing leakages, ensuring fair distribution through schemes like Udan can address this issue. The second one is the use of new technology like effective and efficient irrigation and use of genetically modified crops and use of drones in farming and also like shifting to precision farming methods can aid in the betterment of Indian agricultural system and PDS system also. The third one is legalization of MSP. It can ensure fixed income for the farmers based on the production. The next one is crop insurance. It protects farmers from the crop losses. The fifth and the final one is establishing direct channels. It is a major issue. It can address the middleman crisis in India, which is actually bothering the agriculture sector on the whole and also affecting the livelihood of the farmers in India. See, it can actually ensure upliftment of those communities that are indulged in agriculture sector in India by the way of direct benefit transfers. See, by ensuring accessibility, affordability and availability and also more importantly, sustainability can ensure the success of PDS in India. So with this, let's move to the next article. Look at this article. It is about India's progress in the SDG report recently released by NITEA. So let's see what are the details that has been shown in this report. So it is actually the fourth report of NITEA and more importantly, India has shown a considerable improvement from its previous report. Let's see how. The key improvements have been shown in health, education, poverty reduction. But the challenges remain in income inequality and gender equality. Let's see the India's progress. Goal number one, that is no poverty. See the achievement has been the poverty has been steadily declining from 21.9% in 2011 to 10.2% in 2019. Several schemes like Pradhan Mandri Jan than Yojana for financial inclusion has been beneficial in this regard. And with respect to goal number two, that is zero hunger, the major achievement has been the food grain distribution to 800 million people during COVID-19. And schemes like PM Kisan has been aiding that in India's achievement in its progress. And with respect to goal number three, it is about good health and well-being. Infant mortality rate has been considerably reduced from 50 in 2009 to 28 per thousand live births in 2020. Schemes such as Ayushman Bharat has been a guiding factor for this regard. And with respect to goal number four, that is quality education, see the gross enrollment ratio in the higher education has been increased very considerably from 24.3% in 2014 to 27.1% in 2019 and 2020. Schemes like National Education Policy of 2020 for 100% education has been a guiding phenomenon so far. And with respect to goal
goal number five, that is gender equality. Major achievement has been the women's earning ratio to men has improved from 0.56 in 2015 to 0.73 in 2023. Schemes like Beti Bachao and Beti Padao scheme has been yeah, one of the most significant schemes that help to ensure gender equality in this regard. Now, with respect to clean water and sanitation, that is the goal number six. India has achieved over 600 million people with sanitation facilities, which is majorly because of Swachh Bharat Mission. And there is also a plan under Jal Jeevan Mission for piped water to all the rural households by 2024. And now coming to affordable and clean energy sustainable development goal of seven. See, recently, renewable energy capacity reached up to 100 gigawatts by 2020. But the plan has been for 175 gigawatts by 2022 and 450 gigawatts by 2030. See, these are the major goals that India has accomplished so far. And one more important thing to notice, the goal numbers and the associated goals will be a very, very handy notes for all the UPSC aspirants in our mains and also in the prelims. So, have a note on it. Look at this article. It talks about green financing for the green projects. See, this topic is very important for GS Paper 3 in mains and also for prelims 2025. So, let's get started straight away. See, the green growth has been a top priority because it focuses on green industries and economic transitions. And more importantly, they are environmentally friendly for agriculture and sustainable energy. So, let's discuss about the key initiatives in this regard. First one is green hydrogen mission and then energy transition and storage projects, renewable energy evacuation and infrastructure, green credit card program and more importantly, PM Pranam, which focuses mainly on renewable energy. Then the Govardhan scheme, which is for bio CNG. Then the Bharatiya Trucker KT bio input resource centers. Then for the organic farming, Mishti program. Then for biodiversity, Amrit Daroda. Then coastal shipping and vehicle replacement policies. Let's now go on to see the strategies mainly for the success of green funding and renewable energy transition. The first one is scaling of renewable energy. See, the emphasis on the private investment mainly because they are competitive in cost. And then thirdly, it focuses on the large scale storage solution. The next one is self-reliance in solar panels within five years actually. In this regard, government procurement has been the first priority in this scheme. The second one is production link incentive which highly aids in India's transition to self-reliance, that is, Atmanir Barbara. The third one is long-term rupee debt. It enables a lower bid prices for the developers supported by green bonds. See, green bonds are those particularly help in renewable energy or green energy-based projects. So, understanding this is very important for Prelims 2025 and also for mains GS3. And the fourth strategy is PLI and PEN for battery production. It is very highly relevant for ensuring self-reliance in electric vehicle transition and battery production in India. And the fifth one is green hydrogen for green manufacturing. See, all these strategies will help in India transition to the renewable energy sectors and also help in India attaining the Paris goal commitments and also sustainable development goals. So with this, let's move on to our next topic for this discussion. Look at this topic. It talks about the play for green steel making. Here we have to understand about green steel and associated technologies, which comes very handy for the prelims and also in mains paper 3. So let's get started. Firstly, let's see about the green steel project in India. It is actually led by the Institute of Minerals and Material Technology, that is IMMT. It is supported by the Ministry of Steel. It actually aims for in prelims, the trend has been using statistics and data related to unemployment rate in India. So, understanding this and the related statistics will come very handy in eliminating or assessing the option for the MCQs. So, without much delay, let's get started. See the introduction. Let's start with the basic understanding about the definition of unemployment. It is actually willing and able to work, but actually there are no jobs available. Let's now see about the indicators of economic health. High unemployment can be equated to low demand and supply. Current situation in India as of June 2024 is high unemployment rate which is around 9.2 percentage according to CMIE report. So let's move on to see the types of unemployment in brief. The first one is seasonal unemployment. It is actually very temporary unemployment due to seasons. For example, in agricultural sector, there is a temporary engagement of labors with respect to productive works. So it is very seasonal in nature. The second one is disguised unemployment. Here actually more workers than needed are present. So there will be very very low productivity. The third one will be the structural unemployment. It is only because of the skill mismatch between the workers and the job market need. So there is a technically unemployment prevalence over there. And the fourth one will be cyclical unemployment. It is actually caused by economic downturns, mainly during the recession period, where the state of economy will be very slow. Now moving on, let us see technological unemployment. It is actually a part of structural unemployment, structural unemployment because here the job losses are due to automation like AI and machine learning, which is actually replacing the in-person job of any skilled persons. Moving on, let us see what are the further causes of unemployment. The first one is population growth, which actually outpaces the economic growth, which creates job opportunities. The second one is political instability. It is directly equated to discouragement in investment, which undermines the job creation in India. The third one is economic mismanagement, which is a typical example for the situation prevailing in Sri Lanka and Venezuela, etc. The fourth one will be business environment. See, the rapid economies lead to higher unemployment. For example, North Korea. The fifth one will be environment. It is nothing but the extreme climatic changes, which is directly or indirectly linked to the economic development and also job creation. For example, Sub-Saharan Africa, which is turning very rapidly into an arid region and more arid region and desertic in nature. 
which actually undermines his economic productivity and also job creation ultimately. Moving on, let us see the measures to reduce unemployment. See, government has taken various reforms over the period. The first one to be quoted here is LPG reforms, which took place in 1991. It liberalized economy, improved business environment, and programs such as Mandrega have created 100 days of guaranteed work. And it also a one-third reservation for women, which gives a fair share of employment opportunity for women. The second one will be Green Deen Dayal Upadhyaya Yojana. It majorly focus on skill training, and minimum wage jobs for the rural poor. The next one is Garib Kalyan Rojgar Yojana. It focuses on providing the 125 days of guaranteed work, which is actually an evolution of Mandrika projects. The last one will be Day DDY project. It focuses on like skill development and financial support, basically. And certain important state initiatives like Rajasthan's gig bill aids in addressing the unemployment problem in the state. These kind of examples will be very helpful in quoting in GS means. So have a note on it. See, India's ultimate problem of unemployment can be tackled only by leveraging the large youth population for development. So with this, let's move on to the next topic for the discussion. So with this, we have come to the end of the 